Chapter 16 Pat Stevens' thoughts were not pleasant as he hunkered against the shady side of the W. Bar bunkhouse and stared at the mighty umbrellas, dark etched against the deep blue of the heavens. Somewhere amid those mountains lay the Mirage Mine and the secret of Pete Ford's killing. A short while before, Plumford had ridden away, stiff back and sneering, Ezra had not yet returned from Danville. The sheriff was alone with a dead Mexican and $75,000 worth of ore. Must be growing soft, he told himself, chewing an unlit cigarette with gloomy introspection. Pete Ford beefed, his niece kidnapped, bandits holding the mirage mine, and here he was, stuck like a calf in a mud hole. Powder Valley would begin to think it had one hell of a sheriff when a gang could kill, kidnap, and ship rich ore from a stolen mine and not one single arrest. They were sure making a jackass out of him. And he couldn't do a dang thing about it. Even that damn dude had him roped and hogtied. Sure, he could swear in a big posse and force his way through the gap, but what would it get him? A parcel of good men killed and location of the mirage as much of a mystery as before. Looked like there was a tough gang in on this, border scum judging from the hombres who had escorted the burrow train. More than that, they had leadership. A keen brain had planned Pete's killing, the kidnap of his niece, cashing of the ore at the W bar. Plumford might be the kingpin. Who knew what schemes were hatching behind his fishy eyes? Or maybe Todd Rakestraw, but somehow Todd didn't fit. The monk-faced gambler was as crooked as a dog's hind leg, but he wasn't big enough to fill a leader's boots. Restless, Pat crushed his unlit cigarette beneath a boot heel and drifted over to the disused well behind the horse barn into which the ore had been dumped. The well was about four foot square, uncovered and framed by molding timbers. The sheriff stared down into its black depths and could see nothing. He toted an armful of hay from the barn and ignited it and dropped it to the bottom. The blazing hay hit bottom from twenty feet below. Peering over the edge of the well, Pat caught the glimmer of gold in the heaping rock as the flames rose high. Bill was right. This was the cache. Maybe there was more ore than the one consignment they had trailed. Chances were that dry hole held a fortune. The approaching drub of horses' hooves pulled the sheriff back to the yard. Ezra, his one eye glinting with excitement, looped around between the trees. He peeled out a leather and slapped his mount on the rump, trotted over to the water trough. Ezra headed for the sheriff. "'How's Sam doing?' inquired Pat. "'Oh, sick as a bug in a rug,' snorted the big redhead. They got the runt tucked in bed at the Smaller Hospital with a female person nursing him. When he gets around again, he'll be so doggone spoiled there'll be no living with the Jasper. Sorry, Jim Moreland's in a tight. How come? There's a parcel of toughs and two gun gunmen easing into Danville and they sure took over. Shot up the Cosmopolitan and bored a bartender. Jim stomping around like a bull with his tail tied, straining his guts to raise a posse, but them gun-toting gents got the whole town buffaloed. Jim said, tell Pat they got a choke rope on me and to come a-running. <sighs> the mirage, muttered Pat. I gamble every damn desperado in the southwest is beating it this way. Before long, they'll be as thick as flies around a honey pot. Well, let's get going. Aren't you forgetting the ore? Oh, hell, it can't walk away, injected Pat impatiently. And I ain't setting on it like a hen on a clutch of eggs when Jim's in a jam. He grabbed his rope and ducked under the bars of the corral rate. It was mid afternoon when the pair hit Danville. Main Street bore the earmarks of a battlefield, 
Not a window frame held more than jagged splinters. Swampers with nervous eyes swept up, shattered glass, town folk and smelter men gathered in uneasy groups. A wrecked buggy blocked the street in front of the Danville Hotel. The pony to which it was harnessed sprawled lifeless in the shafts. Pat whistled softly. Hell sure broke loose. They dismounted outside the town's marshal shack and walked in. Jim Moreland, heavy features grim, sat at his desk, shuffling through a stack of yellowing reward notices with his left hand, the right hung limp, heavily bandaged. His eyes lit upon the sight of the sheriff. Well, God almighty, Pat, he declared. I never seen the like of it. The wild bunch swarmed over town like hornets. And they sure couldn't sting. They heist the bank, interjected the sheriff. No, I got a dozen deputies inside, every one I could corral, and they've held the sidewinders off. Can't figure what in hell they sprung from, and they vamoose just as sudden. He held a sheaf of reward notices towards the sheriff. I seen them, Jaspers. Pat pulled up a chair and leafed through the ink drop sheets, broadcasted by a dozen western sheriffs. Ezra, standing at his shoulder, squinted fiercely as Pat read aloud. Well, we got Billy Bright. He's wanted for bank robbery. Dago Dutch, murder and train hold up. Tim Haley, hold up. Martin, for murder. Tagos, also known as Thomas Taglin. Bank hold-ups. Hmm, he mused. How's pretty a bunch of buzzards ever dodged a noose? And you say they skedaddled? About an hour before he rode in. Reckon there was a dozen or more They was heading south. Maybe the Mirage gang rode to town to lick her up, rumbled Ezra. Well, maybe... Agreed Pat, rasping his chin. Well, there ain't gonna be any next time. How you feeling, Jim? Spry as a two-year-old, except for maybe this Finn here. The marshal glanced ruefully at his useless arm. Well, you deputize every son of a gun who can tote an iron. Have them grab their hardware and get together some spot if the buzzer dried back. And then clean up. He scraped back his chair. Reckon I'll hunt up Carlisle, the smelter manager, and get his boys organized. They look pretty tough. A ponderous wagon, wheels locked, skidded down the steep grade that snaked up the hillside toward the smelter as Pat headed for its gate. Eight horses, fretting in the traces. Beside the driver sat a shotgun guard. As the sheriff pulled aside, he noted the wagon bed was topped with steel plates, with hinged lids heavily padded. Silver bricks, he conjectured, en route to Hopewell, end of steel for shipment east. The clapboard yard office was darkened, its door locked. Pat hailed a, a rouse about. Carlisle around? Guess he's quit for the day. The laborer pointed across town. Behind the medley of shanties, a white-painted bungalow sat prim and picturesque on a knoll. There's his shack. I reckon you'll find him there. Again, the sheriff hit leather and jogged downhill, skirting town and headed for the slopes. A neat picket fence surrounded the bungalow. Two wings of the house dropped back to enclose a patio. In the rear stood a white painted horse barn in small fence pasture. Pat trailed his reins outside the house and mounted wide steps to a porch. Roomy rockers with gay colored cushions were sitting invitedly around. The sheriff rapped on the door. A Mexican youth in a starch white coat opened it. Is Carlisle around? grunted Pat. He felt uneasy in face of such luxury. Si, senor. 
The Mexican bowed and stood aside. Pat stepped into a spacious living room, expensively furnished. Colorful Indian blankets drabbed the walls. Well, well, Sheriff, is this an arrest? hailed a jovial voice. The smelter manager issued from a side room and moved briskly across the thick carpet, hand outstretched. Step into my den and have a sniffer. This is a bachelor's establishment, you know. Carlyle led the way into a smaller room. Skins and trophy decorated the walls. Sporting guns rested upon pegs. A longhorn's head was mounted over the rock fireplace and its vast spread of horns almost reaching the side walls. The manager indicated an easy chair and produced whiskey and glasses from a cabinet. He poured a stiff peg and handed it to his visitor and served himself with equal liberty. Pat savored the drink. This was no gut rot. Carlyle gulped his drink and refilled the glass and sank into a rocker. I understand war was declared in Danville today, he smiled. The sheriff nodded. Yep. Gang of two gunmen took over. Guess they've amoosed. But we gotta get ready for the next time. Can your boys shoot? Carlyle shrugged. Well, I could raise a posse, as you term it. Kano, I'll have Jim Moreland ride up in the morning. He'll get the town's folks together, and you fellers can work out a plan to stop this scally hooting. The manager chuckled. Greet him with lead, huh? I'm with you 100%. May even take a hand myself. Always did fancy big game. He flipped open a box of cigars and extended it to his visitor. Best brand in town except Plumford's. That dude Englishman imports his own from New York. The Englishman touched a match to his cigar. Are you acquainted with Plumford? Real well? he inquired. Carlyle shook his head. Oh, no one is. The fellow's as hard-shelled and as close as an oyster. He's been cleaning up the gambling joints and handles cards like a magician. Had to fire him two weeks back. He was taking too much time off. Pat dropped the subject. Reckon you're quite a shot, he commented. He waved his hand at the trophies mounted thick on the walls, indicating a glossy bearskin. That there's a sure Jim Dandy. Oh, I downed him with one shot, returned the manager with well-feigned modesty. I was out on that hunting trip when Pete Ford was killed. Where'd you bring the critter down? inquired Pat, sipping Carlyle's choice liquor with relish. That's the finest pelt I've ever seen. Oh, around Spanish Peaks. There's some real big fellers in that country. The sheriff emptied his glass and rose. Well, I reckon I better mosey along. Never tasted better liquor. The sixth sense which every man who rides hazardous trails develops in a greater or lesser degree to told Bill Williams that another rider had ghosted him as he jogged towards the gap and beneath the shadow of the wall. Twice his head swiveled uneasily, but he could see nothing in the deepening gloom. Still, the foreboding persisted. Finally, he wheeled around a projecting shoulder of cliff, hunched over the horn, and set himself to waiting. Minutes passed, and nothing broke the brooding silence. Guess I'm getting old and spooky, growled the rider, feeling for his tobacco sack. As he fashioned a smoke, the buckskin's ears pricked up. Bill dropped the makings and slid his six-gun out of the holster and tensed. The faint rattle of shale, the click of an iron-shod hoof, reached his ears. In the graying light, a horseman blurred across his front, not six paces distant. The hammer of his gun clicked back as it arched down. Stretch him, 
he rasped. A feminine gasp came in reply. Mommy checked her pony and thrust a restraining hand towards him. Don't shoot, Bill. Suffering polecats, he groaned. You again. It's a free country. Where are you heading to now? He demanded. For the gap. To tip Todd off that I'm breaking through. Caustically, he flung the accusation. You don't mean that, Bill, she replied in a subdued voice. Why else would you be back trailing me? You wouldn't guess, not with that lily-fingered school arm on your mind, she replied bitterly. I ain't trying. Bill's voice had bridled by annoyance. Head south, mommy, and beat it. This ain't no place for a woman. Listen, Bill. Her low-spoken tones quavered with urgency. They've set a trap at the gap. There's a pile of brush at this end. You'll, you'll ride into the canyon without trouble, and then they'll fire the brush. You'll be trapped between the blaze and the gang. It, can't you see it's sure death? The squat rider listened with ill-conceit impatience. For God's sakes, light a shuck. He requested shortly. I don't need no female close herding me. Oh, you're, you're a twin to a mule, she groaned. All right, you ride into the gap and I'll tell you, and then we'll both be shot. Bill glowered at her with dim features that were baffling anger. Here was a contingency he had never bargained for. A pony nickered out on the darkened plain. The buckskin lifted its head to reply. Bill lunged forward and clamped down on the pony's nostrils. At a canter, a compact bunch of riders swept past and were swallowed by the shadows. Who in the hell that? ejected Bill. The argument with Mommy was rake straw erased by this bewildering development. We could drift along and find out, she replied clearly. They're heading for the gap. Without further word, he healed his pony. The girl pulled up beside him. For a while, they rode in silence, stirrup to stirrup. A gunshot punched through the night, and Bill set spurs to the buckskin. The pony leapt forward, its rider searching the veil of darkness ahead. Mommy held her place beside him with ease. The terrain roughened. Huge fragments of rock littered the ground. The pony swerved as they dodged obstacles. A black chasm yawned to their right. The gap! shrieked Mammy. Hold it! But Bill gave the rein to his racing pony. A white light blossomed in the mouth of the dark canyon towards which they were pounding. Dark figures darting around a huge pile of dry brush and the flames licked high, crackling through the dead wood with lighting that was rapidly spreading. In seconds... A blazing barrier of flame blocked the cannon's entrance. Bill jerked his pony to a sliding stop. The slumbering echoes were savagely laced awake by the roar of gunfire, booming forty-fives mingled with sharp cracks of wind gestures. Through the din, the shrieks of dying men cut like jagged knives. Voiceless, the two sat their saddle, staring in fascination at the grim canyon mouth with tongues of fire wreathing up like glowing serpents between giant walls. Slowly, the ragged inferno subsided, and the gunfire slackened and the shouting died. The quick-burning brush blackened in ash, and then glowed with the maraud sparks. Silence clothed the canyon. Mommy swung towards Bill, who sat like a statue, eyes riveted on the glowing embers, of that gigantic bonfire. Well, do you still crave to ride into the gap? Holy rattlesnakes, he breathed. I gather they cleaned out the whole parcel. The poor buzzards had no more chance to get through than a snowball in hell. No, sir. He need the buckskin around. That's right, mummy. This is too doggone big for me. He jerked around and dabbed for his gun as a rider materialized out of the gloom. 
Well, well, friend Williams, came the Englishman's high-pitched drawl. Fancy meeting you here. Quite a show, huh? End of chapter 16